Hey everyone, welcome back to A Pace to Fear God. I'm your friend and Wetterwan Nomarin, and in this video, we are going to be talking about King David, who was indeed a mighty man of valor and by all standards, an icon of Jewish history. Today, we will be speaking about his campaign, his war, under the subject or title, King David's War. Like I said, King David was a man fit for battle. He was someone who was born to fight. And if we study his campaign, as we will in this video, we can see that God truly was with him. If we read 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 10. He became more than just a mighty individual. He became a kingdom that lasted for thousands of years. He gained victory over all of God's enemies in the south, in the north, in the east, and in the west. And because of his military success, he became a type of Jesus Christ, who God would also appoint to gain victory over his enemies in the last days, according to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, where Isaiah the prophet stated, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So, the purpose of this video is to take the campaign of King David and use that to understand the battle that Christ would also fight. And also, we're going to be exploring how God Almighty is a warrior, how he used David to fight his battles. Because the Bible makes it clear that God truly is a warrior. For example, Moses said, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Furthermore, the psalmist stated, who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. And Isaiah the prophet had also stated, the Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. So we're going to find out how that exactly happens in this video. If we go all the way back to 1 Samuel chapter 13, we can see that Saul was king. However, God didn't like the way he was ruling. He did whatever he wanted with the kingship. He sinned multiple times. So then God, in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, used Samuel to tell Saul that your kingdom will not continue because I have chosen someone else, a man after my own heart, who I will make captain over my people. If we move to 1 Samuel chapter 16, we can see that this was the man God was talking about. It was someone named David, a son of Jesse. In fact, the last born, the smallest, who was just a shepherd. God used Samuel to anoint him, if we read verses 1 to 13. Now, there's something I want to say about that particular event. If you read verses 13 and 14, we can see that the Spirit of God left Saul and it went to David. Essentially, when this thing happened, the battle had already been fought by God Almighty. And why do I say that? Spirits are not physical. They don't fight physical battles. They don't use swords or shields. When they want to fight in a physical way, they put their spirit within people. And then they begin to win. So, for example, when God is with someone, when God gives his spirit to someone, that person will win because God Almighty, of course, is God. He's sovereign and all that. He wins everything he is involved in. That's why the psalmist stated, The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. So, when the Spirit of God left Saul, then Saul and his kingdom was finished. It lasted for years after, but at that point, God wasn't with Saul anymore, so... Saul's days were numbered, but because God was now with David, David could only grow. So at that point, it was kind of like Saul was already done, David was already established, even though it still needed to happen in a physical sense. And even when Joshua was fighting too, if we read Joshua chapter 5 verses 13 to 15, as they were going to fight Jericho, 
Joshua had saw this man who was dressed in full military uniform, and he asked him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And the man said, I am the commander of the Lord's army. That's when Joshua knew that he wasn't really the one fighting the battle. His men were not really the one gaining the victories. It was God with his heavenly angels doing the actual fighting because they, being spirits, are more powerful than human beings. So I just want you to kind of get that so that you can use that to understand the role God played in David's warfare. So we see in 1 Samuel chapter 16 that David was anointed and he got the Holy Spirit. Then in 1 Samuel chapter 17, this battle against Goliath or the Philistines was where David really came to limelight because the Israelites were afraid of Goliath. He was six cubits in one span. He was a giant. And anytime someone would approach him, Goliath would approach him, and then that guy would run back because he would be so scared. However, because God was with David, David wasn't afraid of how big Goliath was or all the rubbish he was spewing. No, he was like, well, I'll take down this guy because I've been able to take down the lion and the bear, so Goliath will just be as one of them. Everyone was like, He's just a youth. He doesn't really know what he's saying. But then he charged into battle. And because the Spirit of God was with him, his slingshot was able to take down Goliath and then the Israelites gain victory over the Philistines. So, women began to sing, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. People began to believe in David as a warrior because God with him. If read for Samuel chapter 18 verses 12 and 14. Then we skip to for Samuel chapter 22 verse 2 because this was where David gained his army. If we read it, we see that people who were discontented, people who were in debt, people who were kind of frustrated with their lives generally, those are the kinds of people who came to David and they, they became his army. They became those who he would used to fight and eventually grow the kingdom. So even though these people were low in society, they were valiant men. They were mighty men. They could do anything to fight for those they believed in. So they gathered to David and they became David's people. And if we read First Chronicles chapters 11 and 12, we'll be able to see some of those men. People like Adino the Esnat, who could kill 800 men with the sword. Or people like Abishai, the brother of Joah, who could kill 300 men with the sword. Or people like Benaiah, who could kill giants like that Egyptian who he took the sword from and used to kill him. Those were the kinds of people David had in many numbers. They were valiant men like lions, if we read First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 8. And they became symbolic of Christ's men, the apostles too, which we'll get into a little bit later. But those are the men David had. Then... We skip over to 2 Samuel chapter 5. Everything else that happened in between was just Saul chasing David and a lot of other stuff. But if you read for Samuel chapter 31, we can see that God put an end to the house of Saul by Saul fighting against the Philistines and Mount Goboah and him and his sons dying. There were still some forms of the house of Saul after you know, with Abner, the son of Ner, being the captain of the host, and Ishbosheth being king and all that. But that wasn't hugely significant because David kept on growing and growing, and the house of Saul kept getting smaller and smaller, as it was stated in Second Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, and David waxed stronger and stronger, but the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. Now, if we read Second Samuel chapter 5, at this point, David was king of Judah. He was crowned at Hebron. And he was now really fighting the battles of the Lord, as Abigail said in 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 28. He began by taking on the Jebusites, and he took their city, Jerusalem, and that became the capital of his kingdom, the city of David. Then, the Philistines, when they realized that David was now king and all that, they gathered against him to battle in the valley of Rephaim, if you read verses 17 to 25, and David also gained victory over them twice. The first time, he gained victory, and as he said in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 20, the Lord has broken through mine enemies before me, like a breakthrough of water, if you read that verse in the New King James Version. 
The second time, they gathered again because they really wanted to get to, you know, defeat David's army and all that. And here's where something very interesting happened. God suggested a strategy to David. It shows that God is really a warrior. He can think like someone who leads an army because he told David, take the ambush method, go behind him at the mulberry trees, and there he'll gain victory. And David did that, of course, and he actually won the battle. It shows that God can think like a warrior. Then, we skip on to 2 Samuel chapter 8. We can see that many more significant battles took place here. He fought against the Moabites, the Philistines, the Ammonites, the Amalekites, and he gained victory over all of them. A couple of significant battles were the battles against the king of Zobah, Hadadezer. He even had the support of the Syrians too, because they had a league and all that, yet David crushed them. There was a time in the first verses of 2 Samuel chapter 8, verses 3 to 5, where they were crushed and 22,000 men died at that time. And then in chapter 10, we also see that the Amalekites have called the Syrians for help. And then David also crushed their forces and over 40,000 men died. It showed that God was really with David. David kept on growing and growing and growing. His army got larger. He was able to really expand the kingdom of Israel. And God's name was sanctified across that territory. It was because God was really with David. So, this is King David's war. We've looked at the campaign of David right from the very beginning, when he was just a shepherd boy, all the way till he became king and gained victory over God's enemies. Now, like I said, because of this success we've just looked at, he became a type of Jesus Christ, who God would also appoint to be captain over his army, according to Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 20. Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war, for with thee will I break in pieces the nations, and with thee will I destroy kingdoms. That was God using Jeremiah to prophesy about what Jesus Christ would do. And if you read Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 21, we see Jesus Christ as a warrior, sitting on a white horse with many crowns on his head, representing other victories he would gain. If we read Luke chapter 1, verses 32 to 33, we can see that there was a connection made between David and Jesus Christ. When the angel Gabriel was telling Mary about how significant the child in her womb was, he said, he shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now, the first thing we need to talk about is why did Jesus Christ need to become the commander of God's army at all? Right? Well, let's go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 to 3. Right? We see that God created the world and put two humans on it. However, in Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 to 6, Satan hijacked the system by deceiving Adam and Eve into believing that they could disobey God and nothing would really happen. However, they were sentenced to death. If you read verses 16 to 19. At this point, Satan now owned the system and he began to sell his ideas, the idea that we don't have to listen to God. We can do whatever we want. If you read Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 15, you can see that that was how Satan thought. That was his ambition. He wanted to become like God himself. And then he sowed that seed into the hearts of people, which is why kingdoms arose with powerful leaders, almost semi-gods, believing that they were like God Almighty themselves. And there was a lot of oppression going on. And then there was the spiritual leaders too, who ganged up with political leaders to oppress God's people, especially in the Christian age. The height of their power was when they could crown emperors, like when Pope Leo III crowned Charlemagne, the emperor of France, who had all these bishops and, and powerful people who led churches and did all kinds of stuff. But... As we read in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 21, they were like a rich man faring sumptuously every day, but they didn't regard the poor people because they were exploiting them for their own ends. So that system lasted for thousands of years. That, that's Satan's system we're talking about. 
And if you read Revelation chapter 17 from verses 1 to 11, that system was described about the woman, the spiritual system, sitting on many waters, many lands, being very powerful and all that. However, this was not the system God wanted. And a time came when he told Jesus Christ, okay, I want to end this system and I'm going to use you for it. Because when Christ resurrected and came back to heaven, God told him, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. If you read Psalm chapter 110 verse 1. And when the time came to actually gain victory over Satan and the devil, he called Jesus Christ, crowned him, if you read Psalm chapter 21 verse 3, thou preventest him with the blessings of goodness, thou settest the crown of pure gold on his head, and he was given the command, rule in the midst of your enemies, if you read verse 2 of Psalm 110. And then Christ launched an attack on Satan's system, and war broke out in heaven. If you read Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 and 8, we can see that war summarized. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. What that means is, Satan and his demons lost. However, how do we know that that war actually happened? Right? We see it in the Bible, where you're seeing things like dragon and all that. How do we know that that actually happened in real life? Well, if you look at the two world wars that were fought, from 1914 to 1918, and 1939 to 1945, we can see that that was an unprecedented conflict. And what it led to, no other conflict or struggle in history led to that. There have been wars for thousands of years, of course, like the Hundred Years War and all that. But this particular war, the monarchies collapsed. Satan lost his grip on the world, which is why we have more freedom and peace and happiness today. Haggai the prophet described it as the desire of all nations. In Haggai chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, which, by shaking the heavens, that is the leadership system, which was shaken in the two world wars, all of a sudden we began to see that the desire of all nations fulfilled. In Matthew chapter 24, if you read it really from verse 1 to the end of the chapter, you can see that there were many signs of the times there. And the reason why many of them were troublesome, let's say, things like nation rising against nation, and there being a lot of conflict and tribulation, is because... Jesus Christ would be launching an attack on Satan's system. And naturally, when there's war, there's conflict, there's trouble. That's why in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, Daniel said that at a time, Michael will stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of their people, and that there shall be a time of trouble. That was what was said there. So, anytime we look at the troubles that are happening in this world, troubles in governments, troubles in the spiritual system, troubles in families sometimes and in marriages, we have to be able to see it as a part of that conflict, that spiritual battle that is taking place in our time. Now, I'm talking about battle here. I'm talking about Christ fighting. But what is this army exactly? What, who are the people who are with him fighting the battle? Well, the main people are the apostles, because just as how David had his men who were valiant and went with David to gain victories over God's enemies, you can also see that the apostles preached the gospel message. But what does preaching the gospel message have to do with fighting? Well, you see, Satan's kingdom is not a physical kingdom like that. It's him sowing his ideas into people. That's how his kingdom grows. When his ideas are accepted by people, then his kingdom has grown to those ones, and then it grows. So let's say an apostle preaches the gospel of the kingdom, according to Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. People hear it, and they accept that message, and they become converted to Christ. Satan has lost those people. The ignorance that he would have used to continue to rule those people has been lost because they've been fed with knowledge, according to Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. His kingdom has shrunk because those people were a part of his kingdom, and now that they've been taken out of his kingdom because they've been converted to Christ, he's lost all those people, his kingdom has shrunk, Christ's kingdom has grown. 
So when we see places like Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 and 32, saying that the kingdom would be a mustard seed sown, and then it would eventually grow, we have to understand it like that. The angels give people the Spirit of God, so that when the gospel message is preached to them, they accept it. If we read Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, and Matthew chapter 24, verse 31. And that was why, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 6, St. Paul said that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not physical swords or shields, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So that is the war that the apostles are fighting with Jesus Christ. They are spreading the gospel message so that people can understand that Christ has returned and that he has established the kingdom and he's growing it in our time. And by them moving into that, by them living their lives based on that knowledge, then the kingdom of God grows and expands. However, the battle is a bit more than that because Christ is also targeting the institutions of this world that are set in opposition to God's will. The political institutions that we see, for example, that continue to lead people to not do what God wants. They try to keep people in ignorance. They don't want people to believe in God. If you look at the educational system, for example, teaching people that God doesn't exist in fulfillment of Revelation chapter 13, verse 5. Those are the kinds of things that are in opposition to what God wants, because God wants us to believe in him, of course, if you read Isaiah chapter 43, verse 21. So such things are in opposition to that. And Christ's objective is to make sure that at the end, that idea that we can do whatever we want, we don't have to obey God, don't exist anymore. And the idea that we should obey God for our own good in the end will become the norm. Everyone will just naturally fall into that idea. Another thing that Christ is focusing on is the removal of false pastors. That is their influence over world affairs. We're seeing that it is decreasing in our time. 200 years ago, spiritual leaders had a huge influence, but they simply don't have that power anymore. They can't influence what the government does. They don't have that power over people's lives as much as they had before. And that is going to continue decreasing until eventually all their doctrines will be gone. If you read Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 and 23, and it is only those who preach the truth, who preach the word of God in righteousness, who will be the ones preaching the gospel and people actually listening to them. Before I conclude, I have to mention Joel chapter 2, because in that chapter, the two armies that we've been talking about here were described. Now, what two armies? Well, there was when I was talking about Christ and the apostles, that is, the ones who preached the gospel message. They are one side, because by the apostles preaching, they're winning souls to Christ, and then they're helping in the war effort. And it also includes not just apostles, but anyone who preaches the kingdom message, right? They're winning people to Christ when they're converted to the faith. So that's one side of the war effort. And then I also talked about all the stuff that's happening to the spiritual systems that we see, like, for example, things like the media exposing the wrongs of spiritual leaders, or we see secularity now taking over spirituality. If you read Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 and 16, and if you read Joel chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, we see the latter army that I was talking about, things like secularity. And then if we look at verses 12 to, let's say the end of the chapter, but specifically verses 12 to 17, you can see that second army, the people who are trying to enlighten us about the kingdom, the apostles that I was speaking of. So what I really like about that Joel chapter 2 is that it really summarizes what Christ is doing and the particular armies that help him achieve that. I think it is clear now what the battle Christ is fighting is all about. 
Obviously, this is a huge subject. There are a lot of more things that can be said about it. And there are a lot of more verses, too, that were not cited. But we do have other subjects or sermons in this channel that have covered different aspects of it, such as understanding God's wars and battles, or God will arise and have mercy upon Zion. So if you want to look at this same subject, but in a different way, you might want to check some of those videos out. But what I want us to get is that when there's war, there's trouble. Of course, that's clear. And we have to know that there will be persecution that we'll face if we are on the side of Christ, if, if you read like Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. There will be troubles as we try to do what God wants, but we have to know that what Christ is doing is for our benefit. That's why Christ said, when you see these things happening, look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. If you read Luke chapter 21, verse 28. And of course, the psalmist stated, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. If you read Psalms chapter 30, Verse 5. And that is where I'm going to stop on discussing that subject, King David's War. To conclude this episode, let us hear a tune that some of us might enjoy. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for revealing your wisdom to us. Help us to further understand your promises and help us to also know how Christ is truly fighting the battle in our time so that we can know where we should stand to show our allegiance to his efforts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you have enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you will be notified when we come out with our next video. And I would advise that you click that button, though, because we have another, you know, part to this. We are not finished with the subject. There will be part two. It's King David's War Part Two. Occupy. So be expecting that because it will be coming. Have a great day and God bless you.